Hi guys, and welcome to episode four of the JLX Friends of Benefits podcast with me, your host, Xander Conobit. Today we have our first coach client podcast with none other than the fitness machine herself, Holly Sheldon. Some of you will know her as fit to lift on Instagram. And I'm sure you'll know Holly has an absolute wealth of knowledge and experience across a range of areas within health and fitness. So let's get stuck in and find out some more. So Holly, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. As always, we ask the people who come on a little question, which is based on what projects they've been up to this week that they're excited about. However, as we just discussed off air, you're a super busy person. So it'd be well worth, I think, for you saying, what projects have you been up to across the last couple of months that you're really excited about and would like to share with the, with the people? Yeah, I will try to um, round them up for you in not too many hours, hopefully. Um, so yeah, kind of first and foremost, I am a student. So I'm second year biomedical science at the moment. So it's full on with exam season, um, labs and everything, obviously not at uni at the moment, given the current um, ongoings. (laughs) But um, yeah, studies going on online for that. Um, I'm also applying for graduate medicine at the moment. So getting lots of applications in everywhere, um, prepping for some exams for that side of things as well. Um, I mean, PT wise, I obviously have my business, uh, which is actually surprisingly going great considering isolation we did have our worries um yeah it's been um yeah (laughs) been a really good time actually um the team's growing nicely so I'm actually expanding the business at the moment looking at hiring some other coaches soon um looking at taking things more app based so that's cool that's exciting trying not to um get too carried away before my exam's done but (laughs) it's definitely in the works um doing a couple of extra qualifications as well so I am setting up a charity that's going to be called Synergist um we're essentially going to be offering free exercise to disadvantaged populations so going into things like care homes going into work with children that have more learning disabilities that side of things because there's so many benefits to exercise for them and a lot of the time they can't access it because people don't know how to deliver it safely to those populations so I'm doing a qualification for exercise with the elderly um, and one for disability um, to add on to the S&C coaching and everything so I can go and deliver that once I've got my charity set up um I think that pretty much summarizes it. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So on that point there, what made you go into that? Like what made you, obviously you have a love for sport, you have a love for health and fitness, but was there anything specific that you thought, ah, oh, this is the group of people I really want to help? Or is there anything that you can think of that really led you down that path? I think it's probably just the combination of what I do because I love coaching and, you know, doing my SNC last summer and since being able to work with more athlete specific populations that's been really cool but I obviously want to be a doctor um I'm obviously studying disease and actually I think the biggest thing that I always come away with after doing you know different placements or work experiences is that exercise just isn't used even for you know healthy populations I was in a sports um an orthopedic specialist over Christmas And there were people coming back from the operations that were athletes. And the advice was just rest, don't exercise. And in actual fact, a rehabilitation program that included exercise would have been better for that individual and better for their long term recovery. Um, And then you take these things into like care homes and, you know, obviously in the elderly, they have that they have their restrictions on mobility, but actually exercise has been proven in so many different ways to improve both their quality of life and their longevity of life um and it's such a simple thing like it is it's free medicine and it's not something that's used you know if you look at exercise in children that have autism or adhd there are i think that the rates for were absolutely crazy it was something like a 50 percent improvement in their lifelong prospects because you know, exercise, obviously, you have the physical benefits and the reduction in comorbidities like obesity, but also the mental thing, the the challenges that it sets them, the self-efficacy that they learn. It's it's huge. And again, it's free and it should be done. Yeah. So. Absolutely. I think even in my time, so I've gone under a number of knee operations across the last 
seven years yeah. and even across those the difference in approach has been massive yeah. so the first three I had were under a different surgeon to the last two that I had and it was very much an approach as you said of rest you know if you mess this up you don't want to know what we have to do to fix it kind of yeah, thing exactly. um and a massive shout out to the 40s clinic by the way who did my last two they were absolutely brilliant and he's absolutely fantastic surgeon if anyone's listening to this who's had him will probably agree um but his approach was really different and it scared the life out of me the the morning before i had my fourth in the operation and it was arguably the biggest one i've had the physio said to me you know if this happens you know if we don't reconstruct these certain aspects of your knee and it was still going to be you know my acl was still going to get done my lcl my mcl um, we won't brace you. You'll walk out of here. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> she was like, yep. And then she went and told my surgeon and he walked in. He was like, oh, you don't trust me then. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that was such a different approach. It was, you know, you can still walk. You'll still be able to do these things. And as long as you're sensible, we'll get you back on your feet and get you running far quicker than it, you will do if you're doing nothing. And yeah, exactly. it's really great to see that approach has not just been carried out in a sport specific sense, but as you've rightly said, you know, the elderly, it's, you know, I'm sure you'll agree very much a use it or lose it kind of scenario. Yeah, absolutely. And then, and then when you look at like the younger and uh, age groups, you know, we're looking at people who maybe have disabilities, as you say, what quality of life can we give them from something that is so free, but... I think you'll also agree it may be free and this is definitely somewhere where your charity will thrive. It's not that accessible. You know, I, I write a lot about how, you know, people say, oh, fat loss, you just need to carry a deficit. It's like, well, that's great. But how do you implement that? And it's the same thing, you know, for people who are obese. I've done my um, level four in obesity. It was something a bit like you just wanted a little bit of extra um, knowledge in, in things. And again, it's the same story. It's, you know, this is important for this reason, this reason, and this reason. But what sometimes we fail to look at or certain individuals, coaches, and things fail to look at is actually how do we get that to happen? Because if we don't get that to happen, this knowledge that we carry is fundamentally lost. Exactly. It's, um, I mean, even getting as far as I have has been somewhat um, of a mission. I obviously, I study at St. George's in London and they have, um, they have specific clinics for children with learning disabilities. Um, so I thought, well, that's a that's a great place. We have a, you know, we have a sports hall, especially when it comes to implementing the kind of exercise they need. It's very much, you know, games based with children. That's definitely yeah. something we can do. That's something we can do within the provisions that the uni has. And literally every single step I've hit a barrier that there's, you know, the safeguarding that people haven't heard of it before, that they don't know why I'd be doing it, that they're like, oh, well, yeah, you could do that, but equally we could just give them this drug. And I think it's it's very much getting the idea out to the general population that actually if someone turns around and says exercise, that's not as pawning them off. That's not as disregarding um, the severity of what they're going through. It's as actually saying this is a genuinely good method that is probably a lot more sustainable and will aid you in other areas than just turning to, you know, drugs or surgery you know in some cases those things are necessary but it's just not implemented as a first line measure like it should be and like you say actually accessing it you know children that have come out after you know traumatic incidents or something imagine their quality of life if they were given the confidence and the freedom that actually playing a sport like you know wheelchair netball or something would give them but accessing that is so much more difficult than it should be would you say then, so this is a two part question, would you say that A, as a nation and possibly even as a society, we are more uh, reactive rather than proactive? And my second point to that is, do you think that people are less responsive to exercise? Because actually, that takes a lot more. It takes a lot more habitual changes. It takes more behavioral changes than just taking a tablet would. Yeah, definitely. I think I think we are getting more proactive. Um, I think if we look at what other countries are doing in terms of, you know, the USA or Australia, their actual use of exercise in medicine is a lot further on than ours is. Um, you know, if we take the field of exercise oncology, 
it's mm -hmm. relatively new in the UK, but it's something that if you go to the US and you are going through, you know, an oncologist to get your treatment, you'll probably be referred to an exercise physiologist. And, yeah. you know, the rates that of change and efficacy that actually exercise has, especially, you know, with chemotherapy and that kind of thing is huge, but it's not something that's done here, which is, bizarre you know that there's a paper a really really good paper and it's it's must be a good couple of years old now that looked at a case of pancreatic cancer which is nearly incurable and mm -hmm. this guy every time he came in had his chemotherapy they just sat him on an air bike and he just cycled nothing crazy there was no no real reason other than just giving it a go and he sat on this air bike every time he then had successful resection surgery and has been entirely cured of what is essentially an incurable cancer and that was directly correlated to exercise. It's been proven again and again in so many studies. And, you know, even other European countries like Denmark, um, they are so much more advanced in this. So it would be really exciting to think that we will start implementing it. It's definitely getting more of a name. Um, yeah. I think the whole healthcare system is probably going to get a little bit more holistic as we realise we don't have the funds um, or necessarily the science to just keep getting antibiotics for everything. <laughs> um, so hopefully. Um, I've forgotten the second question because I've rambled again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It was to do with um, behavioural changes and uh, whether you think that maybe the taking a medicine like a, a tablet or something similar is always a better option to the person they're giving it to because actually – in some instances, it was actually their bad behaviors. And I'm not saying this for everyone, but you know, a lot of comorbidities such as obesity, type two diabetes can be caused in the first place by poor habits. And we know it's a cyclic effect. It's not just mm -hmm. one thing that leads to that. But do you think that possibly moving forwards, it's gonna be harder to give exercise as a treatment based on the fact that actually you don't just need an exercise physiologist and you'll know as a coach, it's as much a game of psychology as it is a game of, you know, actually doing it. So do you think that it will be more difficult based on the fact that you have those extra changes that need to take place? I think it's probably what's making it more difficult at the moment, because I think that as much as, you know, if somebody comes and they have a pre-diabetic cholesterol or something, then your your advice would be lifestyle. It would be, well, let's look at your diet. Let's look at your exercise. But I think people have a misconception that if you tell them that they need to exercise, A, that it's insulting, um, and B, that it's, it's almost like they feel like you're disregarding them, that it's almost like drugs are seen as more like, okay, well, there's something wrong with you. Let us help you. Whereas if you turn around and say, you need to exercise, people... I think generally fail to recognize it as something that is so, so key to life, not exercise necessarily, but movement um, yeah. is, is necessary. And I think people that lack that conception feel um, very ignored and will not turn to exercise when it's recommended them because they'd rather, they'd rather have one of these big interventions that makes them feel like they've been listened to. Which is understandable in a respect, obviously, but if we could change that mindset, you know, if we could do things like when GPs recommend exercise, instead of just saying you need to exercise to, you know, a 50 year old woman that's postmenopausal and has never exercised a day in her life, she's not going to know where to start. You know, like you said, it's making it accessible. If you were able to turn around and refer to her to, you know, take the time to consult with her, see what kind of movement would actually be something she would do if you could then refer her to, you know, a local club or a local class or put into place an exercise physiologist, um, a consultation with a nutritionist so they actually understand what do I need to know about food to make those changes. I think that would make recommending exercise a whole lot more accessible. Um, I haven't necessarily seen any indication that we are going in that way. But yeah. I would like to think that that is something that begins to become a little bit more obvious. Um, you know, even if we take what's going on right now, as much as it's been a really weird time, I don't know about you, but I think I've seen people moving more than I've ever seen them move. People are actually Definitely. going outside. They are 
you know, walking, running, jogging, cycling way more than we've ever seen before. So, you know, hopefully that's potentially the start of actually realising that this holistic side of health, this side of health that is totally under our control and is totally free is actually something that we can control a lot more than people thought beforehand. I think that's very interesting. And I totally agree. I think one of the things with just taking back to the GP point, Mm. when somebody is in the GP, I rightly think as well that it is a scenario where A, they get this uh, exercise prescription. I think kind of a three-pronged approach here. I think one, it can be quite embarrassing. Yeah. You know, if you go home and it's just like, actually, you know what, it was, uh, I just need to yeah. do some more exercise or I need to, you know, I need to eat a bit healthier. That can be quite embarrassing because it's only embarrassing because it's well within our control. You know, if you go to the doctors and you break your foot because you fell off a ladder, you know, no one's going to be like, oh, you're on antibiotics, not you would get antibiotics for that, but you get my message. Yeah. I think going away from there and saying, you know, having a categorical problem. And I still think that just crossing over, this is the problem with mental health and why there is still a stigma with it is because people don't fully understand it. And therefore it can't be something that's real almost for some people. It's, you know, it's not something that is scientifically necessarily, you know, hey, here's an antibiotic, that'll do you kind of thing. It's much more complex than that. And so with that kind of thing, I think some people think that, because it's just exercise, uh, you know, quote unquote, it's yeah. not that serious yet. I mm-hmm. just need to exercise a bit more. You know, it's fine. Well, actually, what they're saying is we probably could medicate you right now and it would help. But actually, what we would be doing is putting a plaster over a burst drain pipe rather than just replacing the pipe, which we could do if we get you exercising. Yeah, exactly. Um, which I think, as you rightly say as well, is something that will develop through time. And I think it's possibly even a generational thing. Um, I think if we look back years and years and years, people were either A, more active in their everyday jobs anyway, but B, they kind of get to that age. And, you know, I think of my like my family and my, my parents and, and, and so on. And I think, you know, if exercise was a really good option, would you take it? And I think of us, you know, if exercise was a really good option, would we take it? And again, it's that mixture of education. Obviously, we're coaches, so I'd hope that we both went, yeah, let's do some more exercise. Um, but again, it's that accessibility, isn't it? It's that, you know, this is the route that you need to go down. Mm-hmm. Just like if they gave you medication, they would say, here's an instruction list. This is what you need to go and do. Make sure you give that a good read. Whereas if they say, you know, you would be a bit more active, it's the implementation of that activity that's actually the problem. Yeah, not exactly. you know everyone knows that if they go for a walk you know that's a great start if you don't usually walk go out for a walk perfect um and you know it's those, it's those low-hanging fruits that we need to take out but if it's a case of you know oh, i started this week and you see it in runners i see it in runners quite a lot you know clients say i've gone for a run i think brilliant you know and then my my <laughs> the negative part of me goes how long is this going to last yeah because it's usually quite a big jump from what they've done and then they'll be super sore the next day. Their ankles will be hurt, and they go, "Actually, no, no, r- 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 running is not for me." <laughs> Whereas this is why I quite like the whole ca- couch to five k thing. It's like walk a bit, jog a bit, and then we're building that up. Yeah. Um. So I think in general, that is the kind of way that it would move, hopefully, in in as you say, to a better direction. So my next question, um, here, while we're on the whole kind of uh, exercise prescription. Um, point of view inside the the charity that you are designing what would be then the um the biggest push for you like what would be the most important thing that you could portray that you were doing so what's the message that you would like to to put across in that um well actually that is quite a good time to ask me because i'm actually hopefully going to be writing up the charity aims this afternoon <laughs> <laughs> i guess we good it really comes down to just ensuring that exercise is available to everyone. Um, you know, that's why I called it synergist because a synergist is a muscle that helps the primary mover and we want to be there to help people move. Um, for all that I'm a coach and, you know, I, I love these complex styles of training and the challenges of working with athletes. I believe fundamentally in movement as a principle of exercise you know Mm. people should be able to access something that they enjoy and that doesn't necessarily mean it's in a gym with heavy weights you know if we're looking at children you know going back to children that have ADHD if you can play 
you know, a game that challenges their conception, that challenges their team building efforts, that's going to have far more implications and good implications on their long term health than, you know, being like, right, let's go and do three by 10 lap pull downs. (laughs) So yeah, I just want to make sure that that movement's available to everyone. I remember being at um, a nursing home last year and I don't know if you've seen this, but I think more care homes are starting to bring in things like Zumba, like wheelchair or chair Zumba. And they loved it. They loved every second. People were physically coming into the care home for the day just to take part in this class. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I just think that that's amazing. And it just gives them so much more freedom obviously the you know the physiological benefits that come alongside with that as well um but I just want to make it as accessible as possible I want to make it so that people can hear about our charity and think you know what I want to do that and that that we can help support them while they get their qualifications and they can go out in their local area and they can start making these pathways for people to get involved and to start enjoying to you know, start setting up little sports clubs so we can get coaches on board and, you know, things like wheelchair netball or walking netball. So like you would you would get people going and people would enjoy it and people would benefit massively if we can make the pathways to make that happen. I agree massively. So with that then, we've talked about how you're implementing a charity, how you're doing all your university work. Something we haven't yet touched on is yourself, an exercise that you do. So you're a super hard trainer, you know, a fantastic client to have. Uh, we've worked together, obviously, for a number of months now. Um, so I know all the good, the bad, and the ugly, of course. Um, <laughs> but something that has never, ever failed to really impress me is your ability to take all of these projects, you know, and these aren't lighthearted projects. You know, starting a charity, not an easy thing to do start you know getting your way through med school not an easy thing to do yet you still manage to maintain a business alongside that and you still manage to get your own exercise in and one thing i really wanted to talk about today was how how do you do that so for all the people who would say i'm too busy at the moment what would you say to that and if you ever felt like you were too busy what would you do about it how would you go about figuring out where your priorities lie okay so i'm gonna i'm gonna reuse the word priority there because it literally is there is absolutely time to do everything um and it is merely a case of deciding day by day on what your priority is going to be that day and i think it you know especially if you're balancing multiple projects taking the time to just be a little bit organized and to think what do I need to do and to make a priority list every day to ensure that you get stuff done makes the world of difference um and it's one of those things I'll see everyone when it gets to exam time they'll absolutely just lock themselves in a room for you know 12 hours and my argument would always be you know if you're working at desk for 12 hours be that in your job or your study wherever you're doing are you actually being effective for those 12 hours? And, Mm. you know, I would argue that you are, even if you think you are, you probably are not. If you factor in time where you know you're going to exercise and you go in there with a plan. So, you know, if I wake up and I think, right, I am going to do 20 minutes conditioning, I'm then going to go and do, you know, like I've been doing today, I'll do uni work for the morning. I'll do this podcast. I'll take a break to do my training session. I'll eat, I'll then come back and I'll do my PT work. I'll then take a break for food and then I'll come back and do another block of different forms of work. And actually, I find that taking those implemented breaks where I know for a fact that when I start work, I'm stopping at this time, I'm going to stand up from my desk (laughs) and do some form of movement that is A, going to be a little bit of time for just your mind to switch off, for you to just reset, refresh, and actually just to get you moving so I don't go absolutely stir crazy at my desk having those breaks makes me work 10 times harder when I'm actually working and I think there's always the argument that like yes you could do more but I would rather do really top quality work and have my breaks and maintain that balance than just absolutely burn out trying to incessantly work at something knowing that actually three hours ago I'd pretty much given up and I'm now just staring at a screen blankly (laughs) so 
yeah, it's not easy, as I'm sure you as I'm sure you relate to. And there are days it goes absolutely inherently wrong where you wake up and think, well, this is going to be bad. <laughs> days where you leave too much, you know, days where you are not even demotivated because it is lot a lot less about, you know, being motivated every day and a lot more about habit, about just getting stuff done, keeping the end goal in sight and progressively working towards that. Um and sometimes yeah, it just doesn't go to plan for a multitude of different reasons. Yeah. But I think as long as you can then wake up the next day, put it behind you, get back in your habits, know that what you're doing is absolutely going to be worth it. And I think a large part of why I can balance so much is because I absolutely love every single thing that I do. Um, I might moan about it sometimes <laughs> or get tired or not want to train, but I wouldn't change anything that I'm doing for the world and the long-term goals that I have make keeping that structure and keeping on track with that routine very very worth it so yeah it's tricky but I just genuinely think keeping your priorities keeping a long-term goal and making sure that your long-term goal is something that you are passionate about makes all of the difference in sticking to it absolutely for anyone, by the way, who's wondering something that Holly touched on there about how she layers out her day in very structured manner. There's a fantastic book by um, a person called Cal Newport called Deep Work. And it was recommended to me by one of my clients, actually. And he was telling me about how you basically have these blocks of work that you have no distractions. You know, uh, we talk about how we don't have our phones near us. We don't get kind of bought into notifications and things like that. But the important thing is, is that actually figuring out how long can I actually work for, for a set period of time before I start going, oh, cat videos. <laughs> Or, oh, what from BBC News? Because this happens, you know, you'll all catch yourselves doing it where you're actually working, but, you know, I'll go on YouTube sometimes to find a new client video and there'll be like 10 crazy cat videos. I'm like, well, obviously that's the right option right now. <laughs> you know, And that to me just says, take a damn break because what you're doing, you've obviously had enough. And, you know, I'll look at the time and I'll be like, oh my God, I've been here for an hour and a half. And to me, if I'm, you know, if I'm really hammering out a plan and, you know, you put all the complexities into it, you're thinking through it, you're thinking of the client, all the bits of equipment they've got, especially obviously because we're not in the gym at the moment, then that just gets, you know, to that point. Where I'm like, right, I need to just take a 15 minute break because, you know, it's a bit like having a deload in training. You can either carry on and you'll be less efficient through time yeah. or you can take a break and you can hit hard for that period of time. And would you agree then that that, limits the amount of burnout you feel because you obviously do a lot of work um more than most so you know would you would you say that actually having less uh or more intense work blocks but less of them uh is an effective way to to keep on working and keep on getting things done yeah absolutely i could not sit at a desk for 12 hours i would literally i a, I would lose my mind. My back would completely give in on me. It would, it would be bad all round. And I think, especially because I have work from different areas, being able to split my time up and have a block of uni work and then have a block of something else. It's like I said when you asked me to do the podcast and said, do you have time? And quite frankly, I, I well, I, I'd enjoy doing the podcast anyway, but it's also refreshing doing a different kind of work because then you come back into your other project and it's it's something new. It's something that you think, yeah. oh, I haven't been slaving away at this for eight hours. So, you know, after uni work, I thoroughly enjoy then having a break to go and write client programs. And then I'll enjoy going and doing some charity stuff and enjoy doing my application. And it's, it just keeps things a little bit fresher. And it means that you always know that the end is in sight rather than just blindly trying to do everything in one. <laughs> So you mentioned about how the next day, it's really important to get back on those behaviors, get back on those habits if you have a bad day, which leads us on to our, our final question that we ask everyone, which is, are there any habits you're currently trying to break that you're unhappy with? And are there any habits that you are trying to make that you think would you would benefit from? Hmm. Good question. I think on the basis of what we've just spoke about, for all that um, I'm very good at saying, yep, break your work up, take your breaks. I'm not inherently good at taking breaks. I do take them. Um, 
but I have been to be yeah I have been known to be on my laptop until 11 12 p.m and then back on it at 7 a.m and I would argue that it's probably not the best thing and this is I I feel like you have had to put up with me writing this on my check-in sheet every single week without fail that I will turn my laptop off by 10 p.m <laughs> whilst writing it at 11 <laughs> 59 yeah. So it's it's work in progress. <laughs> we're definitely we're, we're, that's the habit that I am trying to break because you know we all know that sleep quality makes a huge difference. You know, energy being able to recover in between your sessions, then actually that has an impact on do I enjoy my sessions? Do I feel like I've had a break from work? Probably not. If I'm then sore, and it all just comes back round. So oh, yes. that's definitely a habit that I am trying to um trying to sort out a little bit (laughs) um in terms of habit that I am trying to build I don't I suppose like I've kind of found my routine quite well now and it's working quite well for me um I mean something that is a little bit different but training twice a day has been massively beneficial for me which normally is, you know, it's not something that I'd recommend widely or without knowing quite a lot about the person. But for me, actually being able to have, you know, 10, 20 minutes in the morning of movement before I start working, actually making that session, you know, more conditioning style, because, you know, I love that style of training and actually working on that element of things. Then having, you know, a slightly longer session later in the day where I really just slow down and take the time to really go through that split to work on the strength and the technique side of things that's in terms of my training and in terms of giving me like a mental break throughout the day that's that's actually been working wonders for me so it's definitely something I'll carry on with through lockdown we will see if it um, remains we will who knows what's going to happen after lockdown anyway but um <laughs> that's, been, that's been a really really good habit for just improving the quality of my training overall I think fantastic well a massive thank you Holly for your time today we really do appreciate it Um, and as always I hope you have a good day and I hope everyone's well speak soon bye (laughs) we're going to be adding in a QA and a to the podcast in a few weeks time and to do that we're going to need some questions from you guys so do go over to our team Instagram page at JLX coaching on Instagram of course and click the link in the bio and it will take you to a quick Google form where you can fill in uh, any of the questions you've got and we will get to those in the podcast to come. As for coaching, you can also check the link in our Instagram bio for that or go to the website, which is at the moment, jacklenton.com and you will see the links to coaching there. Have a good day.